Welcome to lesson 14 of industrial instrumentation. Uh, in this lesson, we will continue with the flow meters. Uh, as I told you repeatedly before that uh, the number of flow meters are huge and uh, in number. So, we have to continue on a several lessons and you have to discuss details in details all the flow meters. So, in this lesson basically we will cover uh, the one open channel meter which is uh, very widely used for irrigation purposes that is VR and also we will discuss uh, direct electrical output flow meter that is turbine flow meter. right? So, let us look at the contents of this lesson. Uh, flow meter 3 as it happened. Now, we will have contents. So, we will first discuss the wares, its principle, its application, what are the different types of wares that also we will discuss and then we will discuss the a variable reluctance stacko generator because the using that principle we will use we will make the uh, turbine flow meter. Turbine flow meter advantage is the direct electrical output. So, in many application it is popular um, and moreover uh, it is unlike uh, uh, differential pressure flow meters. Uh, you do, we do not need any conversions and square rooting all these problems are not there in this type of flow meters. We will also discuss the turbine flow meter. Now, at the end of this lesson, obviously, the viewer will know that uh, how to use a wear in the uh, systems. I mean, how the, uh, the person can be a person can use a wear for uh, measurements of water flow, especially mostly it is used for water flow in an open channel like canal or duct, right. Uh, that means, principle of operations of open channel meter that is wear. Open channel meter we have already discussed that not only where we have actually um, pitot tube is also used, but pitot tube as you know it is mostly used for the uh, used for the gas and it is not suitable for the dirty liquids because when you are talking about the measurement of the uh, flow of water in a canal or river you cannot expect that it will be very clean. So, it will be extremely dirty in that sense. So, we need some other a rugged flow meter. So, in that sense, where has no other, there is no other alternative than where to use the measurement of flow in open duct, I mean open channel, right, like canal, river, like that. So, we will also look at the magnetic pickup because this magnetic pickup we will find that we will use in many applications, uh, measurements of velocity and all these things. So, the principle is same whether I suppose if I want to know that an RPM of a motor. So, that can be utilized and the, the magnetic pickup is also used there and also if I want to know the, uh, the liquid flowing in a pipe. So, what is the liquid flowing in a pipe if I use some magnetic pickup. So, that is also I mean that is a part of the uh, turbine flow meter that is the reason we will discuss magnetic pickup also. Also the turbine flow meter with direct electrical output. So, these three things we will discuss in uh, I mean people I mean the, the viewer will know the details of these three component. Now, let us look at the wear. Wear you see it is an open channel meter first of all that is I told you repeatedly it is an open channel meter it is not a closed channel meter. Now, if the flow rate of a liquid in an open duct or channel such as a river or canal is required a wear can be used there is no other alternative as I saw it can be used but in fact actually there is no other alternative than using wear. It is extensively used to get an estimate of flow of water in a canal or duct for irrigation purposes. Okay. So, whenever there is irrigation, so how much water is to be uh, given to a particular land and all these things details, I mean this estimates is only possible by if we use wear. Right. So, it is uh, very much suitable for measurements of the liquid in the open, it is not for um, gas. So, it is only for the liquid and mostly for water. And principle of operations of wear and moreover one thing I forgot to tell you that it is you see it does not depend on the uh, depend on the temperatures and all those things. Many other sophisticated uh, as you know there are many complicated <coughs> flow meters are there. So, but it does not depend on temperature. Suppose if the water is coming out of a boiler if I want to measure if you are discharging that water somewhere. 
So, that type of measurement is also possible in uh, by the uh, by means of air because the, the, if the temperature increases it hardly matters to air or the flow coefficient also does not change much. You see the flow rate <coughs> excuse me the flow rate over a wear is a function of the wear geometry and the wear head. You will see that basically there are two types of wears uh, used one is rectangular wear and is V notch wear. Usually the rectangular wear is used for the large flow measurements and the uh, V notch wear is used for the low uh, flow measurement and um, however, you will find that the V notch wear are, uh, is actually more accurate than the more accurate than the rectangular wear. In this particular lesson, so we will discuss or we will derive the uh, flow velocity as well as the quant uh, volume flow rate for the in the case of rectangular wear, but we will give the expression for the volume flow rate uh, whenever we are using the V notch wear anyway. So, it depends on the wear geometry right Ge geometry and wear head what is wear head let us look at. The wear head is defined as a vertical distance between the wear crest and the liquid surface in the undisturbed region of the upstream flow. So, this uh, terms we will use repeatedly the undisturbed region of upstream flow. So, it looks like this we will discuss we will see here if I take a blank page you will see the we are actually in that is a restrictions like see it is a restriction like this we will give the figure. So, water is flowing through this side ok there is a channel right. So, water is flowing from this side right. So, if it is closed on this side suppose, so liquid will flow over this one right this. So, this is called the crest of the wear right. If you look at it I mean if I take a side view it will look like this sharp edge. So, water is falling over this liquid right. So, this is the in fact actually I mean you will see that this will be like this one that means I have a if I take a side view. So, the water is falling. So, falling like this. So, this is our undisturbed region of the upstream right. So, this will be our H which will be uh, shown in the next figures right. So, here if I take the velocity V 1 and at the crest if I take the velocity V 2 then we can easily write the Bernoulli's equations right. Our goal is to measure this height H ok by any means. So, what are the different means that I will show you later on. So, by measuring H I can calibrate this instrument in terms of flow that means, H can be calibrated in terms of flow and mostly it is indicated type of instruments or monitoring type of instrument is hardly used for transmission purpose right. So, that is I am saying the wear head is defined as a vertical distance between the wear crest and the liquid surface and the liquid surface in the undisturbed region of the upstream flow right. The semantic of a wear is shown in figure 1, the rectangular wear is shown in figure 2 and flow of liquid over the sharp edge of the wear is shown in figure 3. So, in subsequent 3 slides we will find that we will show you uh, the wear geometry and rectangular wear and flow of liquid over the sharp edge of the wear. So, these are all in figure uh, figure 1, 2 and 3 respectively. Now, you see that this is schematic of a wear as I have shown you. So, this is a duct it assume that this is a river or a canal. So, the liquid is if I take a different pen liquid is flowing in these directions right and flowing out in these directions. So, restrictions we have put like this right. So, in a Collins dictionary you will find the meaning of the word wear is basically a dam, but actually it looks like a dam I mean restrictions, but so there is a as it happened in the case of dam there is a level of difference in the upstream and the downstream the similar thing is here also right. Let us look at very carefully you see this is our crest of the wear right. 
liquid is coming here and falling down right. Now, if I put a float on this side which can move only in the vertical direction then what will happen this according to the if the flow velocity is high. So, this height will go up right this is h if you look at h because liquid is suppose the liquid is, is in this up to this level right. So, from the crest to the undisturbed water level that is the h or head of the wear. I repeat that the from the crest that means the sharp edge of the wear to the level which is undisturbed water level is a capital H that is the heat of the wear actually we will measure H right by some means. So, this is a schematic of wear. Now, you see this is a rectangular wear. So, this is we will discuss later on what is small h what is d h. So, this is our crest of the wear right and this is the water level not necessarily it will go to the top right water level may go up to this position. In fact, this should be uh, not up to this this should be uh, should be the it should end here right. So, this is the water level this is the h right. So, from this crest to the upstream uh, undisturbed upstream water flow level that is the capital H not this part right. And for derivations later on we will see we take a small section d h at a height of h right from the top of the undisturbed flow level ok undisturbed flow level upstream that is we are taking. So, at a distance h from the undisturbed upstream flow level we take a section we are with d h this will be needed for later on to find the total volume flow rate or volumetric flow rate in the rectangular wire right. Now, let us look at let us look at the how the wire of the water flowing on this wire where h is head on the wire as we told and l is the length of the wire is basically length of the crest of the wire and small h is the distance below the free surface of the water where v 2 exists that will be shown in a more I mean clearly in the next. Uh, next slide right you see here yes it is clear now you see this is the upstream undisturbed region of the upstream flow right this is the water level this is the undisturbed region of the upstream flow if I take a plane this is the undisturbed region of the upstream flow. So, this is everywhere this is same because water is I mean coming like this one. So, this level. So, it is undisturbed. So, after that you see water height start to fall right. Now, in the previous slide if you see what we have uh, seen Okay. Here you see what will happen let us go back in here. So, this is the distance h okay. in the previous uh, slide. So, you see here h is a, uh, is a we have taken a section of uh, small section d h of height d h at a height from the undisturbed region of the upstream flow of h that means if you look at so this is our h this is from the upstream okay this is the from the undisturbed region right fine now see what will happen so this is h and the velocity uh, above the crest is v2 and velocity upstream is v1 clear if it is there so, I can immediately. So, this sharp edge is very important, we will discuss later on because uh, if it is not sharp, the calibration constant will be modified. So, you can usually after a certain months, we can just change the wear, keeping all other dimensions constant so that the our uh, the flow coefficients will remain same as before. Let us look at. clear.
Now, if I apply the Bernoulli's equations at a undisturbed region of upstream flow and at the crest that means the sharp edge of the wire we can immediately write H plus V 1 square by 2 G capital H minus H plus V 2 square by 2 G is not it because the height is if I take from the datum level. So, it is H minus small h right if I go back you see h minus small h at these positions my v 2 exist and h is exist. So, in that case we are taking this one as a dotum level is not it you see this is we are taking as a dotum level. So, this is h height plus v 1 square by 2 g. So, at this one is v 2 square by 2 g plus if I take this one as a dotum level. So, it is h minus h where v 2 exist is not it. So, if it is there, so I can write this equation. So you can interestingly you can see here that uh, all are dimensions of height because if this is in meter. So, this will be uh, meter square plus second square. So, g is meter per second square. So, obviously, it will be in meter clear. So, no problem in that side. So, dimension a it is correct right where V 1 is the upstream flow of the liquid and V 2 is the flow at the crest of the wire that we have told uh, one, once we have shown you the diagram. So, obviously, if I manipulate the equation, so the equation number 1, so it will come as uh, come up as V 2 equal to because this H and H will cancel out V 2 equal to 2 G H plus V 1 square by 2 G right. Now, in most cases you will find that the V 2 the speed at the crest will be always a very uh, very large that we have seen those who have visualized near the dam you will find that whenever in a log gate specially you will find that the when the water is flowing over just over the log gate the uh, speed of the water is very high compared to the uh, I mean calm upstream flow right. So, in that cases so I can obviously tell that the V 2 will be much higher than the V 1. In that case what will happen you see we can simplify these expressions like this if V 1 is small compared to V 2 then we can write V 2 equal to root over 2 g h right this is equation number 2 right. However, the ideal flow rate if I want to now find the ideal flow rate because this is a velocity at is because it is not very easy to measure the h right because this is the we are getting the flow at the uh, crest. So, it is uh, please remember another thing whenever it crosses the uh, if I take a blank page it is easy to understand you see here what will happen whenever the liquid I have a crest here. So, if I take some other pin. So, you see here. So, here the velocity is V 1. So, liquid is falling down here is V 2 at the crest right. So, here you see the again the velocity will reduce. So, at this position only the velocity will be high. This velocity will not be maintained once it falls down the velocity will also be reduced in this region. It is already less than V 2 here also this velocity will be less than V 2 right. However, the ideal flow rate over the wear is obtained by integrating the quantity V 2 into d a. What is d a over the area a of the flow plane just above the crest of the wire? What is d a? Let us look at what is d a? You see d a is actually we are finding d h multiplied by L that is the d a. So, d h multiplied by L will be the d a. So, we will integrate over the height h okay so we'll get the total flow velocity if i come down here okay now you see so theoretically what we can write that if i go back so how about the ideal flow rate over the wear is obtained by integrating the quantity v2 into da velocity at the crest multiplied by the d a, d a is a small h section so at the height h from the top small h of width d h. So, d h into l will be the d a over the area a of the flow plane just above the crest of the wear right. 
So, we can write uh, Q theoretical that means theoretical volume flow rate equal to V2 into dA. So, it is a meter, uh, meter cube per second because this velocity is meter per second it is in meter square. So, if I that is if I convert so it will be 2 g h right root over 2 g h already we have seen multiply by what is d a l d a that I told you earlier. So, this will be equal to uh, integrated over instead of a will be from since it is all converted l is constant only h is a variable. So, we have converted I mean, this integration varies from 0 to h. So, if I uh, do it so I will get the expressions equal to 2 by 3 under the square root 2 g into l h to the power 3 by 2 please note it is h to the power 3 by 2 this is equation number 3. Now, however, this is as it happened in all flow meters. So, we see that every time we have to multiply by a flow coefficient sometimes we call flow coefficient some, sometimes we call discharge coefficients. So, it is very sometimes very difficult to uh, measure actually to find theoretically the value of the all the discharge coefficient best thing is to find experimentally with some standard flow meters right. So, however, as it happened in any other flow meter uh, the actual flow rate is less than the ideal flow rate due to the vertical contraction from the top and the friction loss and the presence of the liquid flow that is not horizontal. Therefore, the actual flow rate is given by. So, vertical contraction this is a slow contraction from the top if you look at you see here. So, there is a slow contraction from the top right I have a wear. So, there is a, is not that suddenly it is coming. So, it is a slow contraction from the top and we are assuming that the all flow velocity is like this and like if I have wear we are assuming that the all velocity is in this direction this is not necessarily true velocity will be in this direction some velocity will be in these directions also right. So, you have to take care while we are making the if you if we are interested to find the actual flow rate right. For the reasons we are telling you see how the actual flow rate is less than the ideal flow rate due to the vertical contraction from the top and the friction loss and the presence of the liquid flow that is not horizontal. Therefore, the actual flow rate is given by Q actual equal to C D Q theoretical 2 by 3 square root 2 G C D L H 3 by 2 this is equation number 4. Where C D is the discharge coefficients of the rectangular wear and it lies between uh, 0.62 to 0.75 and the wear must be uh, sharp for this coefficient to be valid over a long period of time before the flow meter is recalibrated right. This I told you earlier also that means this edge should be very sharp otherwise what will happen you will uh, see that this uh, the calibration constant or discharge coefficients will be modified that is happens in all the instruments ok. Most of the instruments like uh, you see in, in the case of venturi we are when we discuss the venturi meter in the case of venturi meter this type of calibration is not necessary. But we have seen in the case of orifice meters this if the age is not is not 90 degree rectangular orifice you will find that the discharge coefficients will be modified. So, we best way during the routine maintenance you change the orifice if you know the thickness and everything is same dimension is same the orifice hole diameter is same you do not have to recalibrate right. Similar in the case of discharge coefficients or in the case of wear also. So, during the routine maintenance of suppose after using one month or so or two months depending on the how much water how much is the corrosion in the water and all these things we can just change this uh, wear yeah, and it is not very expensive equipment that is also it must mention I mean this to be I mean this to be explained because it is not uh, expensive compared to the I mean if you look at the other uh, open flow a meter it is not very expensive. So, in that sense it is replacing an wear is not very expensive affair right. So, when the flow rate is low now we talked about the rectangular wear, but there is another type of wear as, as I told you this is called V notch wear. When the flow rate is low a triangular or V notch wear is more suitable for measurement of flow. This type of wear is more accurate than the rectangular wear right. It is for the low velocity flow rate, but it is more accurate right. A V notch wear as you can see is shown in figure 4 right. You see here also. So, this is the length of the V notch wear 
Okay. This is also restrictions instead of rectangular this type of uh, where will be put it and so this is the is slowly increasing this is the included angle theta as before we have taken a section d h okay, from the top of uh, from top of the undisturbed flow region h and h is the height head of the wear. Okay. As the liquid flow increases this head will increase will go up h will increase please note because in the previous case also we have seen that is h is increased right. So, total idea <coughs> excuse me the ideal flow rate for V notch wear is given by Q theoretical equal to 8 by 15 under the square root 2 g tan theta by 2 h to the power 5 by 2 4 l by 15 h if I, I may replace tan theta by 2 uh, under the square root root 2 g h to the power 5 by 2 this is equation number 5 where l is the width of the wire or length of the wire or width of the wire whatever you say it is same thing right. So, it looks like this you see. The we have seen that anyway you see here. So, this is the included angle theta. So, tan theta will be how much tan theta will be L, L by 2 this total is L. So, it is L by 2 divided by H if I take tan theta. So, exactly that thing I did in the next slide. So, tan theta by 2 is replaced by I mean L by 2 divided by H. So, it will get 4 by L 15 H root over 2 G H 2. So, L is the width of the wear. So, what is the variable here in the Q theoretical also? You see H as the liquid flow volume flow rate increases H will increase right. The height or head of the wear is increased. This H is to be measured by some means or the other right. All other things are constant L are constant G is also constant. So, it is a quite non-linear okay, as you can see. So, this h is to be measured and this height is calibrated in terms of the volume flow rate. However, the actual flow rate as it happens in the case of the rectangular wear also you will find the actual flow rate will differ from the theoretical flow rate. So, it is to be multiplied by the discharge coefficient C d 4 L by 15 h. So, under the square root 2 g h to the power 5 by 2 equation number 6, where C d is the discharge coefficient that lies between 0 0.58 to 0 0.6 because this experimentally found it is very difficult to find the theoretical value of C D. So, what the people did they have taken some standard and then they compared and found the C D value. Now, equations 4 and 6 indicate that the flow rate of the liquid depends on the height on the head capital H right. So, that capital H is to be measured what is the capital H that is the upstream height of the upstream flow from the crest of the wear right. What is that very clearly let us quickly let us look at h I have to measure some or the other. What is that that means I have a liquid is flowing right. So, I have a liquid flowing like this one on this stuff. So, this h is to be measured as the flow rate increases this h will increase. If the flow rate decreases this h will decrease right clear even though it is nonlinear I mean relation, but so, if the flow rate decreases this h will decrease if the flow rate increases this h will increase right. So, I will measure the h and calibrate it in terms of the flow rate fine right. Now, as I told you earlier also you see the wear head is measured by a float activated displacement transducer and it is placed in the upstream side and it is usually used as an indicating instrument. It is not for the I mean transmitting instrument people tried in though I mean trust, but it is not for the I mean actually it is indicating or monitoring instruments. Usually what they do you see in the upstream sides I mean uh, they are making a sometimes they are making a float like this ones right. So, one like this ones. So, there is a it is put on a cylinder right, right transparent glass ok. These actually spheres 
which acts as a float. So, what will happen? So, this is put on the upstream side right. What will happen if the water level increases? So, this float will go up this float will go up like this one right. This float will go up like this one and if you have a graduated scale here on the glass itself. So, I can measure this height and calibrate it the height in terms of flow. So, these are basically for balancing if you use single that means the problem of balancing. So, they use three uh, actually if you take a top view three spheres like this one okay. 120 degree apart three spheres made of plastics okay and put a uh, if I take top view you cannot say so it is like this one right. So, if I take a side view it will like this one three spheres. So, one float. So, as the liquid I mean if the flow increases this will go up. So, this is calibrated in terms there. So, this is all about the wear. Now, wear as I told there is no other alternative for education purpose for me and it is quite robust is not that accurate obviously, uh, but it is uh, get an estimate of the flow of the fluid especially in the irrigation uh, purposes right. Now, our next uh, uh, transducers which we will discuss is the uh, basically we will discuss the turbine flow meter which is a direct electrical reading uh, flow meter, but uh, to know the turbine flow meter we must first look at the variable reluctance taco generator. Uh, and what is the some basic terminology of the um, uh, reluctance and magnetic force we must tell in brief and its units in SI then we will go for turbine flow meters. First we will look at the variable reluctance taco generator because exactly that principle is used to make a uh, flow meter. So, let us look at magnetic force magnetomotive force is a force that causes flux to be established and it is analogous to the electromotive force for electric circuits right. The unit of MMF we write magnetomotive force we write MMF in SI units is the amperes is actually ampere turns, but it is actually telling about the single uh, turn, but it refers to a coil of one turn right. The opposition to the establishment of magnetic flux is called the reluctance. So, reluctance whenever reluctance increases your flux decreases if the flux increases reluctance decreases right. So, the reluctance is defined as R equal to MMF magnetomotive force divided by the flux phi right. Rearranging I can write MMF equal to R multiplied by phi right where MMF is in ampere turns if the number of turns is more than 1 and phi is the flux is in waiver. Now, principle of operations of this uh, variable reluctance taco generator let us look at. If the time varying flux phi linked by a single turn of coil all of you know, know this is the basic principles then the back EMF developed in the coil can be expressed as E equal to minus d phi by dt right. Here you can see the variable electrons taco generator shown in figure 5. You see this uh, uh, we are showing uh, a wheel with teeth or blade whatever you say ok. There are several teeth you can see or blade several teeth here and this wheel is made of uh, this teeth actually is made of ferromagnetic material please note this is made of ferromagnetic material and a coil is owned on a permanent magnet and this pole piece is made of soft iron. So, what is that this coil is owned on a permanent magnet this pole piece is made of soft iron and this teeth is made of ferromagnetic material. Now, you see what will happen there is a flux will be developed is not it how it looks you see the flux will be go like this one sorry if I take a new page I think you should go back. So, if I take some other color I think let me choose this color. So, the flux will look like this one so it is go like this go like this go like this go like this in this correction is not it. Then what will happen you see you see what will happen that when the when this 
teeth or blade comes to the very close actually this gap is very small. So, just for I mean sake of understandings we have drawn in such a I mean larger gap in a, theoretically this I mean actually in, in the actual in the variable electron stack generator this gap is very small. Then what will happen? In this case whenever it comes to very close to this reluctance will be small flux will be high and in between the teeth suppose this is this wheel is rotating in a direct in, in, a, in a anti clockwise directions with the angular velocity of omega you see this one this is your angular velocity wheel is rotating with an angular velocity of omega right. Now, what this angle is theta what will happen you see if this rotates the, the wheel rotates like this one right then what will happen if it rotates. So, whenever this wheel uh, I mean in between the two teeth suppose the teeth is has gone down this direction this this was most this now this pole piece faces the the gap in between the two teeth then what will happen reluctance will increase. So, there is a change of magnetic flux right right. So, what will happen this output voltage there will be variable output voltage okay, time varying output voltage will get if it rotates with the speed of omega right. So, using this principle we will find we have made a turbine flow meter. So, here again I will repeat this is made of permanent magnet right and this pole piece is made of soft iron and this teeth is made of the ferromagnetic material. Now, the teeth of the wheel moves in close proximity to the pole piece it is I mean very close to each other as I told you that because we, we for the sake of understanding we have uh, drawn that much of gap, but it is actually there is no gap this gap is very very small right this gap is ultimately there is no gap at all. So, it should come very close to this right this will come very close to this that means if I take it. So, this will come very close to this right that you please note. So, it should come very close to this like this one anyway. So, the teeth of the wheel moves in close proximity to the pole piece as I told you therefore, the flux linked by the coil changes with time and the voltage is developed across the coil. The total flux phi subscript capital T linked by a coil of m turn is given by phi t equal to m phi m m m f into uh, divided by r, r is the reluctance number of turns of the coil is m. So, it will be given by m into m m f by r. Moreover, we know that when the reluctance is minimum the flux is maximum and vice versa so, that I have to explain to you already. The variation of the flux phi t with the angular position theta of the wheel will be expressed as this we express in the sinusoidal variations we can express is phi t theta equal to alpha plus beta cos n theta. Okay, what is this abbreviation let us look at where alpha is the mean flux and beta is the amplitude of time varying flux and n is the number of teeth of the wheel if there might be 4 wheel there might be 4 teeth there might be 8 blade. Okay. So, the, here in this case we assume that the number of number of teeth is n. So, we can write phi t theta is time varying theta total flux with respect to the angular position of the wheel is equal to given alpha plus beta cos of n theta clear. So, E the output voltage which will received at the coil is given by minus d phi t by d t total flux equal to d phi by minus d phi t by d theta into d theta by d t that always we can write is not it. So, again we know that a d phi if I differentiate my previous expressions that means, if I differentiate these expressions. So, I will get if I differentiate these expressions I will get d phi t by d theta you know minus alpha will cancel alpha d alpha by d theta is 0. So, minus beta plus into n into sin of n theta 
Now, theta is a omega is a circular frequency and theta is an angle at an instant of time. So, if you multiply it by omega by t, I will get theta obviously theta should be in radians. So, equal so d theta by d t equal to omega quite obviously if I differentiate this with respect to t I will get omega. So, I will substitute all this in the equation in the, these expressions right in these expressions I will substitute this value of d theta d phi t by d theta and d theta by d t I will substitute in these expressions. So, I will get by omega I should say is the rotational velocity of the wheel. Now, E equal to beta n omega sin n omega t what does it mean? It means you see that the uh, output voltage from the variable reluctance stacco generator okay, is a function of the angular frequent amplitude of this it is sinusoidal signal okay, the output voltage if it rotates at a constant velocity of a circular frequency omega that means the wheels rotates at a constant velocity of the circular frequency omega then you will find that output voltage is expressed as beta n omega. So, this is very important expression. So, I should write. So, what is amplitude? amplitude? Amplitude is beta n omega of this output signal and with the frequency of n omega. That means, I can say the amplitude of this signal. So, that means, I will get an output voltage if it rotates at a constant angular velocity beta n omega and, and the frequency this amplitude that means, a and frequency is equal to n omega by 2 pi is not it I mean linear frequency. So, output voltage depends on both. Okay. So, later on we will see that we will little make some little uh, manipulations of the or little signal processing by which I want to make that output voltage will be only proportional to the frequency of rotation that the frequency increases or output voltage also increases, but here it is not because if the frequency increases amplitude also increases your your if the I mean flow velocity if the, if the number of rotation increases number of the wheel rotating which that is increases this omega increases your output voltage also increases, but does not depend directly only on omega here amplitude increases here your frequency also changes. So, two are changing simultaneously that is not very desirable properties. Right. Now, in turbine meter exactly this principle is utilized right this principle is utilized in turbine meter you see what will happen it has a direct electrical output this is a great advantage in, in the other flow meters we have seen that we have to make lot of manipulations of the signal processing we have to do like differential pressure flow meters rotor meters we have seen that this is a lot of pitot tubes all we need a different lot of signal conditionings. Uh, sometimes it is not signal conditioning circuitry in that sense it is a electrical sometimes you will find this pneumatic signal is coming you have to convert with the DP transmitter and so many things are necessary which is not necessary in the case of this type of direct electrical reading meter. No it is not much in use because of the some disadvantages anyway it has a direct electrical output the flow meter consists of a wheel with a multiple blade. Now I am uh, telling here blade uh, because the shape is like a blade in the case of turbine meter, but the blade whatever I am talking now it is similar to exactly similar to the teeth in our wheel of the just discussed uh, variable electron stacco generator right. So, there is no distinction between the blade and the teeth please note and it is installed inside the pipe in which the clean fluid is flowing this clean fluid the term clean is very important you see the it should be clean liquid should be clean otherwise there is a problem okay, that we will discuss later on. So, the flow meter consists of a wheel with the multiple blade and it is installed inside the pipe in with the clean fluid is flowing. A schematic of turbine flow meter is shown in figure 6 I okay, will show you the turbine flow meter. You see this is our turbine flow meter. So, we have a magnetic pickup what is that magnetic pickup this is a permanent magnet okay, on which their coil is owned. In fact, there should be a two terminal should come out. So, two terminal will come out right these two terminals will measure the voltage E right. What is this inside the magnetic pickup this is a magnet. Okay. So, these blades are, are made of ferromagnetic materials we have shown the four blades right four blades you see these are in angle little angle. So, the when the flow is I mean the liquid is flowing it is impinging on the blade 
okay. if it is impinges on the blade so this this will start to rotate if it start to rotate then what will happen if it is angle is like this one if it is like this one then what will happen and if I take the camera like this one you see here see if the blades is slightly like this likely it happens in the case of so liquid will flow over this one right in this direction so what will happen you see here in this direction so it will start to rotate right so similar thing so this is made of ferromagnetic material I have magnetic pickup here what is that magnetic pickup is made of permanent magnet on which the coil is on with soft iron pole pieces since it is ferromagnetic material whenever it rotates for each rotations of the whenever this blade pass this permanent magnets I will get a pulse okay, at the output or I will get a time varying signal at the output. So, that will be calibrated in terms of the flow right let us look at the details of this one. The turbine meter must be installed along the along an axis parallel to the direction of the fluid flow in the pipe right. The flow of the fluid past the wheel causes it to rotate at a rate proportional to the volume flow rate okay. it should be proportional to the volume flow rate. The wheel or blade of the meter is shown in figure 7 you see this little bit this each wheel causes an angle of alpha right angle of alpha and you see here the wheel actually if I take from the uh, along the axis of the pipe the wheel will look like this one this blades will look like with the t thickness t and it is as an angle alpha okay it is actually it looks like this. So, the it will have an angle like alpha, like this one right. So, this is angle alpha right. So, the water is water or liquid is flowing like this one it is hitting this blade. So, it start to rotate in these directions right. Construction you see the construction of a turbine flow meter is made of similar to variable electron stacko generator no difference. The blades or teeth are made or teeth are made of ferromagnetic material. Magnetic pickup consists of a coil owned on a permanent magnet. A voltage pulse is obtained at the output of the pickup whenever a turbine teeth or blade passes the pickup coil as I told you. The flow rate can be determined by measuring the pulses by a pulse counter. So, if I can measure by a pulse counter, I can measure the flow rate as simple as that. Moreover, I can find the total volume flow rate if I count the number of pulses over a certain period of time. That is a great advantage of the turbine flow meter. That means, the total volume of liquid flown over a certain period of time theory. If a number of rotation of blades per second is f, and the volume flow rate is q then we can obviously write f equal to k into q. So, the q can be determined by measuring f. The total volume of liquid Vt flown through the pipe over a given time t will be expressed as Vt integral 0 to t q dt. The total number of rotation of the blade over the time t is expressed as n t. Now, we have total number count we have expressed t to 0 f t t k q d t into so it is coming k v t right. So, q d t so we are in k v t right the total count is proportional to total volume flow of the liquid ok. Obviously, this we can measure by some counter so which will give you the total volume flow of the liquid right. The voltage induced in the magnetic pickup will be periodic in nature whose frequency is proportional to the angular velocity of blades right. So, assuming the drag force due to bearing and the viscous friction negligible the rotor angular velocity omega is proportional to the volume flow rate given by obviously, what will happen as the volume flow rate increases your or the velocity increases obviously, the omega also will increase. Omega depends on what the omega depends on the velocity of the fluid flowing through the pipe. So, in turn if I velocity if I multiply it by the A area of cross section of the pipe. So, obviously, I mean I mean minus the area taken by the hub and all these blades and all these things I will get the flow velocity angular velocity. So, I can say that the angular velocity will be proportional angular velocity of the turbine flow meter is proportional to the volume flow rate. So, that is actually we have written. So, the velocity of the fluid is given by u equal to q by A right A is the area of cross section. Now, you see where A is the area of cross section of the pipe minus area of cross section of the hub 
and area of the blades. So, that we have written pi d square by 4 minus pi d square by 4 n h minus d by 2 into t. So, this will be very clear you see here. Uh, as you can see from the I mean the in, in the from the construction, so this will be very much clear. Okay. You see here, so this is H. H will be not exactly d by two. Please note, H is not exactly d by two because there is a gap. There should be some gap to blur because we have to give some space to rotate, right? So, this is our expressions we have shown pi d square by 4, the total area of cross section of the pi minus that the half, the area taken by the half minus the area taken by the blades, right. So, all these things if I, so where n is the number of blades and it and t is their average thickness. So, moreover we have seen that uh, omega h by u equal to tan alpha by in fact, omega is equal to tan alpha is not it exactly. So, omega h is the velocity of the blade tip because that is a circular cross section is circular frequency multiplied by h is the velocity of the blade, blade tip and is because h is the actually if you look at h is the h is the height of the blade from its central position is not it. So, if I multiply by the omega, so it will give the speed of the tip of the blades right per second the velocity of the blade tip perpendicular to the directions of the flow obviously that will be very much clear because the uh, liquid is flowing in this direction. So, the blades is rotating in this direction. So, if the direction of flow is this the blade will rotate in this direction. So, I can write that alpha is the inlet angle and a at the tip. So, k 1 equal to omega by q to tan alpha by a h right. So, the output voltage from the magnetic pickup will be given by beta n k 1 q sin n k 1 q by into t equals number 7, where beta is the amplitude of the angular variations of magnetic flux, n is the number of blades and q is the volume flow rate. The equation 7 indicates that the output of the magnetic pickup is a sinusoidal signal of amplitude beta n q and the frequency is n k 1 q by 2 pi where which can be written m f into q where m is called the static sensitivity or the meter factor of the equipment right. Now, you see one thing you must note that uh, if I look at here, if I look at in these expressions you will find this will say again this is the expressions what we are getting you see that uh, it depends on the frequency of number of uh, sorry it is a uh, beta is depends on what are the factors? Q as the Q increases, its amplitude is also increases. Q is the volume flow rate increases, amplitude increases. The simply what they do actually, uh, they uh, take a if I take I have a turbine flow meters, if I take a sorry. So, they take a meter, then they pass through an integrator our turbine meter. then integrator, okay. then a Schmitt trigger. What will happen you see once you integrate I will get a signal which depends will I will get a constant amplitude signal. Okay. Uh, I will get a signal which looks like this you see the here I will get a signal this output of the Schmitt trigger is a constant amplitude signal because Schmitt trigger is a pulse shaper as you know. So, I will get a signal that depends only on the frequency okay. as the that means that means as the flow velocity q changes okay. here both the amplitude of the signal also will change here it will not because integrator this amplitude will cancel out flow will cancel the q is can will cancel out. So, the at the output of the Schmitt trigger I will get the only the frequency. So, the constant amplitude frequency I will get. So, that frequency can be calibrated in terms of the volume flow rate let us look at let us go back again.
So, that is actually they do in the case of meter. So, provided that the turbine wheel is mounted in low friction bearings, the measurements of accuracy can be as high as plus minus 0 0.1 percent. It is less rugged and reliable than the restriction type differential pressure flow meter. The blades and the bearings can be damaged if solid particles are present in the liquid. This is the most important point, liquid should be very clean, right. There is another problem, it is more expensive and it is also imposes a permanent pressure loss on the measurement systems, even though it is not as high as uh, because we are I mean putting some restrictions in terms of the blades and all these things. So, extra pumping is here also, okay. So, it is not that it is totally open channel like I mean it is not to totally the uh, permanent pressure loss free I am flow meter. So, there is a some certain amount of permanent pressure loss in this type of flow meters. So, the typical range is uh, usually 10 percent to 100 percent of full scale output rating and below the 10 percent of the full scale rating the bearing friction makes. Turbine meters are particularly prone to large errors when there is a significant phase change in the fluid being measured. Turbine meters have a similar cost and the market share to positive displacement meter and the former <coughs> are similar smaller and the lighter than the latter. Okay. Now, this is the ad some advantage, but as I told you in the turbine flow meter the basic principles that uh, I am getting an output the flow velocities which I am getting is the it is uh, we I am getting a sinusoidal signal at the output of the turbine flow meters since the basic principle is the taco generator. So, as the flow velocity changes amplitude changes as well as frequency of the signal also changes frequency of the sinusoidal signal. Now, if I pass this signal to through an integrator then what will happen? So, this will cancel out. So, I can explain this again let us go back you see here yes here you see here what will happen. So, if I integrate this signal if I integrate this signal then what will happen you see. So, I will get beta n k 1 if I take a different color please do not. So, beta n k 1 q cos of n k 1 q into t divided by this n k 1 q. So, this n k 1 q n k 1 q will cancel out. So, after the integrations I will get E equal to beta cos of n k 1 q into t is not it see here right I will write it clearly E equal to beta cos of n k 1 q into t. So, what does it mean? It means that you see that uh, beta is a constant it does not depend on the flow velocity. So, amplitude is directly proportional to the frequency. Now, what will happen it I will pass that signal after integration I will pass that signal through a Schmitt trigger I will get a constant amplitude pulses, but the frequency will change as the flow velocity changes. So, if I measure that frequency that frequency will be calibrated in terms of the flow right. This is the advantage of this type of meters. So, with this I come to the end of the lesson 14.